It's good to be here again. I've gotten, Brent's been so gracious to give me a few times to get to speak to you all. You all know by now, if you've been here, I can, I'm really good at taking off the plane. I'm a terrible lander. So I'm sure it'll be the same today. We'll just come to a point and we'll put on our parachutes and we'll bail. Because I don't want to create the mayhem out in the parking lot that I, I've personally experienced a number of times. Um, you know, we, we're in Romans. I love how Brent has been leading the church to take like big pieces of scripture and camp out for a long time. You went through John before, going through Romans now. After this, we're going to go into the Acts of the Apostles, season one, chapters one to 14. And um, Romans, it's 16 chapters, and we come now, really, I think, to the climax of it, to the pinnacle of it. But interestingly, I would suggest to you that the pinnacle of this letter in the spirit of Jesus and the way of the New Testament, it's not the top. It's actually the bottom. You remember the V, right? We're journeying. We have just come on an eight-chapter journey, and we're all the way down to the very bottom, where Paul just starts singing. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the life-giving law of the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. Clearer words probably aren't spoken than those. And that's at the very bottom, at the very foot of the very cross of Jesus Christ. That's where we've got to come to today, is that place. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the life-giving law of the Spirit has set you, set me, set you, set us free from the law of sin and death. That's the great problem in the world, the law of sin and death. That's, if, you, if you get up, you read the news, you look around, you get in traffic, you understand. That's what we're dealing with. That's the explanation for the condition of the entire world and my own brokenness, the law of sin and death. And we cannot set ourselves free from that. Only Jesus can. I, uh, about 10 years ago, we started a little company called Seedbed. Our mission is to sow for a great awakening because we've come to realize that things aren't, gradually getting better. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Things aren't gradually getting better. What we need is a, sus a sustained intervention of the power of God in our lives, in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, and in our cities. And God has a, a record of doing that in history. And we're coming up on a time when it's overdue. And so we are, I carry seeds around in my pocket. I'm not going to throw any out today. But I carry them right here to remind myself what I'm doing every day. Sowing seeds for great awakening. But you know what I've discovered? The, the greatest, I've discovered, A, that has to start with me. It doesn't have to start with you. It has to start with me. And I've discovered that the greatest impediment to my own awakening is that I'm pretty sure I'm already awake. <laughs> okay? Think about that. The greatest impediment to my own awakening, maybe yours, is that I'm pretty sure I'm already awake. 
I'm there. I'm doing it. So I came across some research about 10 years ago by a guy named George Barna, super credible, um, super credible. Hey, somebody got a text. <laughs> That's not me. Uh, wake up, sleepers. Rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. I forgot to say it. That was my reminder. Thank you, Lord. That's why I say that. My own, I'm pretty sure I'm already awake. Every morning, the first thing I say out of my mouth, I say it out loud. I say, wake up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then I hit my knees, and I begin to, to consecrate myself to Jesus for another day. Anyhow, so found this research by George Barna, and it nailed for me, and I think it will for you, the situation that we're facing, at least in this country, if not around the world. It's about five minutes long. I thought, it's, I'm gonna, I said it faster 10 years ago. I made this video. It's the first thing we did. I made this little video, and I, I probably said it better and faster than I could now, and I don't want any comments at the end about how I've aged and grown. Uh, <laughs> You'll see. Let's show this video. In 2011, George Barna conducted a research project that he claims is one of the most challenging projects he ever undertook. Over the period of six years, his organization made telephone contacts with 15,000 people. And they were asking them questions about their spiritual life, their Christian faith formation and development. They were trying to ascertain where are people in North America in their walk with God, so to speak. The results were astonishing. Barna found from his research that people tend to find themselves at one or another of what he calls the 10 transformational stops. Number one, unaware of sin. Number two, indifferent to sin. Number three, worried about sin. Number four, forgiven from sin. Number five, forgiven and active in the church, in the activities of the church. Number six, holy discontent. Number seven, broken by God. Number eight, surrender and submission. Number nine, profound love for God. And number 10, profound love for people. It gets really interesting when you see where the population of Americans fall across the spectrum. 1%, 16%, 39%, 42%. Nine percent, twenty-four percent, six percent, three percent, one percent, point five percent, and point five percent. It's not surprising to see most of the action centering around numbers three through five. You're a sinner, you need a savior. Pray this prayer and you're forgiven. Now get involved in the church. What's fascinating though, is the way the spectrum begins to break down after the first half. From number six, holy discontent, through number 10, profound love of God and people, nine and 10, only 11% of the population fall within that range. On the other side, one through five, we see 89% of the American population, according to this research. It seems clear that we're going halfway, but not the other half. You see, John Wesley said the people uh, called Methodists 
were raised up for this second half. In fact, he used the language. He said that this gospel, this truth of sanctification, of holiness, is the grand depositum which God has seemingly raised up the Methodist people to proclaim. And from this research, it looks as though we have not proclaimed it very well. So Seedbed earnestly desires to see the bars get raised on the right-hand side of the chart. On justification by grace through faith, we stand squarely with the magisterial reformers of the church. But we think today what is most needed is a revolution of sanctification, a renaissance of scriptural holiness. In the 18th century, Count Zinzendorf, who was a founder of a Moravian community at Hernhut, great influence on the Wesleyan movement, maybe said it best when he said, many people will follow the Lord halfway, but not the other half. He said they will willingly give up possessions and property and wealth, but it touches them too deeply to disown themselves. You see, that's what the whole gospel is about. It's about profound love for God and profound love for people. Seabed exists to sow that whole gospel into the whole world. Will you join us? All right. That's pretty clear, isn't it? That tells a story. Uh, To me, it's the only way we can account for the magnitude of religious and spiritual activity we have in this country and how little we have to show for it. I mean, things are not moving in the right direction. So our question is, how do we begin to move from the first half of the gospel to the second half of the gospel? You see this very clear in the eighth chapter of Romans. Well, let's just think about it. the first half of the gospel. Let's just, let's just say Romans 5 and 6, right? The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, but, but God shows his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, thereby proving God's love for us. That's the first half of the gospel. That's, I would call that the justification by grace through faith. But the second half of the gospel, you, you begin to see it, well, right here in, in verse 3, what the, law was pow- what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live, who do not live, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. This is, this is sanctification. The Holy Spirit coming into our life, raising us up with Christ, making us to be like him, the The church fathers and mothers in one accord, God became like us so that we could become like him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God. First half of the gospel, I would call it, you know, at best, believing and behaving. Second half, beholding and becoming, getting our eyes fixed on Jesus, our hearts lifted to him, our minds set on him, our eyes fixed on him, our our bodies offered to him, living in union with him, living filled with the Holy Spirit. It really is about helping Christians become Christians. (laughs) That's what the second half of the gospel is. Is all about. Now, if we were to do the math across this room, there are probably 300 people out here today. 
That's about three rows. About three rows of people in a room like this will be making progress in the second half of the gospel. Now, you go all the way across to the end of that chart. You remember the last two markers? Profound love for God. Profound love for people. That's the goal. It's not to become a religious person. It's not to become super spiritual man or woman. It's about becoming a person of extraordinary, extravagant love to the point that you actually become powerful in the spirit. You know how many people we would have in the room? We might have 30, 30 people of 300 who are making progress. I know you're all thinking that's you. <laughs> But you remember, I'm pretty sure the greatest impediment to my own awakening is the fact that I'm pretty sure I'm already awake. You know how many people we'd have in that, those last two bars? Three. Three. They would be outliers. Um, and I, I mean, everybody immediately thought, well, that's Margarita Brent and Mark Swayze. <laughs> Three. Guys, this is the situation of our, this is the issue of our time, is can the people of God rise up and actually become the people of God? That's it. That's what great awakening is. And so you see, when, when the people of God, you, wake up to the second half of the gospel, the world will wake up to the first half of the gospel. That's how it happens. That's what keeps the world asleep is because they're like, nothing to see here. They look at the church and they're like, nothing to see here. And they go hit snooze again. But it's within all of our reach. And in fact, the people in this room who immediately said, you know what, I know I'm not in those 1%. You're actually closer than the people who are sure that they are. This is the beautiful thing about the gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is not a self-help program. This is not a, a self, if it is to be, it's up to me. It's, this is not about actually learning more information. It's about the surrender of your life to Jesus so that your life might actually become who you were meant to be from the very start. And that's nothing more and nothing less than a person who profoundly loves God and who profoundly loves other people. That's the whole thing. And it's, 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 not, it's not hard but it's comprehensive, it's, it's totalizing, it's, um, it's about entrusting yourself to him. So I'm already run out of time and I told you, I don't know how to land. There's so much that can be said here, I wish I had a week. Um, do you know the, the reason why we're stuck? I can say it about myself, and I can, I can ascertain it about you. The reason that we're stuck over here on the first half side, it's not because we don't know enough. It's not because we haven't read enough. It's not because we haven't been in enough Bible studies or gone on enough mission trips. It's because we don't have the kinds of relationships it takes to sustain long-term transformation. You see, the second half of the gospel is not a solo, it's a team sport. And it takes, we've discovered, two or three people around you over a period of time to actually become the gospel, become the love of God, to actually uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Become love. About eight years ago, I was making a talk like this, the big conference, talking about this whole thing about relationships. And, and I was just at the stage, I just said, and you know what, I'm, I'm chief of sinners here. I, I don't have those kind of relationships. I got a thousand friends on Facebook. <laughs> but I don't have these kind of people right around me who really know me. You see, the, the key to becoming love is becoming deeply known and deeply loved anyway. And the truth about most people, they think in themselves, you know, if people really knew me, they wouldn't really like me. And do you know the opposite's actually true? You know what people don't like? They don't like fakers. They don't like hypocrites. They don't like people who are trying to hide. What they do like is somebody who'll be real and invite them into their life. So after I made this talk, I said, I said, I'm not doing it. I haven't been doing it and I've got to do it. I've got to get myself, and I called, we, we just started talking about bands, B-A-N-D-S. A couple of my good friends came up to me the next day. They said, you know, you've got to do this now. And they offered themselves as my band, and we became sort of band number one in our sort of seedbed world, right? Banding's been around for centuries, but we're trying to bring it forward. And so the three of us started meeting every Friday morning at 8 a.m., on the phone. And we developed this as we built the plane as we were flying it. We, we decided, first off, there's no curriculum here. Our lives are the curriculum. We're not going to read books together. We're not even going to do Bible study together. We're going to ask each other five questions. We'll start with three. How is it with your soul? Which is to say, what's, we're all good at talking about the weather. What's the weather inside? And then we, we say, what, what about the struggles in your life and the successes in your life right now? And we just talk through those, share. And then how might God's word and spirit be speaking in your life right now? And we just, you know, you hardly know the answers to these questions because you don't stop long enough to ask them of yourself. And and so we, we share that, and then we pray for the one that just shared, and the next one goes. And uh, the meeting takes about an hour, and we do it every single, we've been doing it for eight years, guys, and I can tell you that in the last eight years, I have actually grown more in my real faith, in my real becoming a person of love. In the past eight years, I've grown more than I had in the prior 25 and it's the most simple thing in the universe, but I wasn't doing it. And I'm starting to make progress because progress begins with deep, profound honesty. <laughs> Just telling the truth. You know, there's two more questions that after a period of time, as we began to trust each other, we began to ask each other these last two questions. Is there any sin in your life that you would like to confess? And um, we don't confess sin to each other to be pardoned by God. James 1.8 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? So that you may be healed. You see, we all have a way of confessing our sins to God and sort of taking them right back into the darkness where they continue to exercise control in our lives. We just started telling each other, like, yeah, this, is, this was a fail. And um, immediately, the healing begins. We begin to, once you go to this kind of place with a couple of people, you're free with everybody you're ever with ever again. You don't hide anymore. And that's the, the, the final question. Is there anything you want to keep secret? <laughs> That's, that's the boom. And it's very rare that there's an answer to that, but after the trust is built, you know, there's research out there. There are 38 kinds of secrets people keep. AA, you probably heard it from AA, we're only as sick as our secrets. And somebody will share a secret, and guess what? It's not a secret anymore. You never have to share it again. It's out there, and you're set free from it. 
And like I say, I mean, those last two questions, those are phase two. We call it phase two. We're just trying to get people into phase one. I've been encouraging your church, your pastors, Brent. Uh, this is coming to the Woodlands, this whole move of what we call banded discipleship. We built a website out there. It's called banddiscipleship.com. You can see it all there. We give all this away. But, you know, I thought rather than a nice, warm, and fuzzy, maybe funny story to close the sermon, I'm just going to put it to you. You see the challenge we're facing. You feel it internally. And here is a real, real solution. In fact, this is the solution to one of the wicked problems of our time. Isolation, mental illness, anxiety, depression. This crushes all that. There are not enough therapists in the world. God bless the therapists. There are not enough of them, and it's not ultimately a sustainable strategy. Do you know what this is? This is called friendship. <laughs> it's as old as Jesus. I call you my friends. Everything I've learned about my Father, I've made known to you. So let's pray. Father, each of us here, I know all of us personally, and I know all of us together. What we want, we want to be people of profound love. When at the end of our days, when they're about to lower us into the ground, that's the witness we want to be sounded above the ground. Oh my, how they loved, how they loved me, how they loved their family, how they loved the community and the church. They were powerful people. And we know we can't make that happen. We've tried. And we know it's totally possible in you. And yet you've not made us to be by ourselves. So, Father, I just even want to almost prophesy here that, that this church would become a church not of loose connections, but of tight bonds, of banded love. The seeds are hitting the ground, and this is where we're going to leave it today. We can sow the seed, and pastors can water, but only you, God, can make it grow. But it really comes back to to each of us, just fixing our eyes on Jesus and saying, you, Jesus, says, you came to be like us so that we could become like you. And we don't want to stop. We know we get stuck. But we're ready to, to run with perseverance the race you've marked out for us. We're ready to become the people you imagined when you first created us. So we just, this is the altar of, of saying yes to you, of being honest with you, of moving forward with a new kind of intention and action. Yeah, it's for, it's for, it's for our good, it's for others' gain, it's for your glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.